Um, you just tell me when you're ready to beam this up to the reptilian overlords. Okay. Yeah. So don't say what we're saying before about who shot JFK. I don't know anything about any alleged conversation we may have had for anyone who's listening. About reptilian overlords that rule the world. Which is a joke, and we don't think that's true, and... <laughs> right? Of Hey, look, I'm wearing serious glass. I'm wearing hipster glasses, which means I'm a very serious person, okay? Yes, that's... You gotta believe what I say. That's definitely what I think when I see those types of glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thought that comes in your mind. That or quarter, that, quarter life crisis, or I bet he's a great librarian. Which one? Uh, I, I actually go with I bet he eats a lot of fermented food, but that works mm. too. I bet I bet I avoid gluten. That's what you that's probably what you think by looking at these glasses. I'm just saying like gluten is a problem, right? I have global inflammation, okay, that I'm trying to get rid of. It's like it's not global inflammation. You're actually 10 pounds heavier than you should be. Um your bloating that you're experiencing is actually just that opposed tissue that you see on your stomach. Well, I thought we were going to get away from such a judgmental podcast with this and you turn over a new nope. leaf, but here you are. <laughs> <laughs> new year same me eric i love it that's, yeah. that's the reason no. why i'm here with you hey we're just messing around we're excited for this episode today welcome everyone to another episode of iron culture the podcast i'm joined with my co-host co-pilot eric helms dr eric helms phd um he won't tell you that so i have to remind everyone this is a learned man okay who's been studying things and we're tackling a variety of different topics on this podcast. We're doing a several part series on the history of lifting, the history of physical culture. Today is going to be a slightly more, I don't want to say informative podcast, but a topic that gets brought up very frequently. We're going to be sharing our perspective, but also talking with individuals, experts that have knowledge on the subject that we don't to learn a little bit more about PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. Yeah, I think... <sighs> A society never benefits from suppression or sweeping something under the rug or pretending it doesn't exist. And I'm like, like Omar said, you know, we're not experts on this, um, but the, the, the information that does exist that I've seen is either hyperbolic. It's, you know, people who are talking about PEDs for, for, for uh, entertainment purposes in, in the lifting community. Uh, or it's people who are talking about it in a, an alarmist way or a minimalist way. Um, and there's very few frank, honest conversations about not only drug use in, in the fitness community, but what that means and why someone might choose to do it uh, and what responsible decisions and thoughts might go into uh, making that choice. While obviously Omar and myself have chosen to be drug free and, and to not do that. And we have our reasons for that, which we'll get into when we have our guests on. Um, it doesn't mean that we, we are anti drug necessarily. It's just that we are pro informed choice. And I don't want, I don't want to speak for you, but for me, um, when I have all the information, when I assess my values and my goals, um, and the meaning and the why behind what I do, that leads me to the, the informed choice of being natural. And I think, that's not going to be everyone's choice, but I do want people to go into it with eyes wide open, uh, whatever they choose. And I think that's what I, what I hope to accomplish uh, in this conversation with, uh, with our guests. Absolutely. And I think I'm glad we can have this open conversation. As you said, I don't think it's healthy to try and suppress information. And so I do, and I hear people, you know, on my YouTube channel, let's say like, Omar, why are you covering steroids or talking about steroids or talking or featuring people that use, you know, PEDs if you're natural. And the idea is that I can respect someone else, their own choices, what they're choosing to do. And by having these individuals on, how... You know, one, it's much more pervasive than people realize that the use or the consideration, the, the fact that people consider is like, but if you're going to have that uh, consideration, like anything else, you might as well be informed and know the rationale why the actual effects and have a frank conversation where you learn a lot more rather than just relying on word of mouth from someone else, something from the internet that's maybe not reliable, and then hearing multiple perspectives so you can make your own choice, as I think you said, Eric, is very valuable. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's it's almost um, disrespectful of the the intellectual ability 
and the uh, the inherent desire to learn of all of us to think that you know ideas are dangerous and that they we shouldn't we have to suppress some or only promote good things or, or whatever your value system is. And not that I think you know like we're promoting bad things with this podcast, but I think um, people should be fully informed before making a life choice uh, that that may have legal that may have health uh, ramifications. Um, and knowing the, the, the full spectrum of what you're getting into, I think that's just responsible and it's part of being an adult. Um, it's not putting your head in the sand. It's, it's just uh, being more aware. So, yeah, and it's, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's a lot more pervasive than people realize. And um, I think that's not talked about in an honest way either. You get, uh, like we've talked about a number of times, you get people who will act as though, Everyone is on gear or people who act as though no one is on gear, but they're just this, this, the middle ground isn't there. Um, and I think it, it's nice to actually hear from people who actually know, not someone who has watched a lot of YouTube, you know? Yeah. Or le- yeah, learn their information from Reddit where they're just like, it's like, I know now everything. I read one person's experience. Here we go. And so today we have uh, two guests that are going to be joining uh, joining us for this conversation on PEDs. We're going to have John Meadows, who is uh, someone that's been in the lifting community for a long period t- of time, also known as Mountain Dog. He is a bodybuilder. He is someone that has been open about his anabolic use. And so we're going to be asking him about his experience, uh, asking him a variety of questions. And then we also will be having Dr. Got to throw that in there, Mike Israel who is very knowledgeable when it comes to lifting, uh, when it comes to just distilling information. This is a topic that uh, he is informed about. You know, I could speak for myself. I know I'm going to learn a lot today because I know next to nothing. And so having someone that has uh, uh, the science and then uh, someone that has experience as well as uh, the information to share their perspective and then having coach right here, Dr. Eric Helms in the house to talk about being, you know, a natural bodybuilder in your choice. And then me, maybe I'd classify myself more. I don't mean this disparagingly, but when I say a recreational lifter, I've not competed. And so you're a physical I'm, culturist, bro. Yeah. I'm a physical culturist, iron flat earther. Um, <laughs> all our perspectives. So I think it'll be an interesting conversation. No, I totally agree. It, it's, it's, it's going to be cool to have um, both, you know, theory and, and, and experience and, you know, John Meadows, is he's an IFBB pro and um you know he carries a level of muscle mass that there is very very few people on the planet who do so does Mike Israel they're both very 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 muscular dudes and I'm sure Omar will at least at one point or another thank them for that as he is he is wants to do uh but yeah like what you can expect in this episode is a discussion around uh, the decisions and the thought processes and the whys and the considerations that that probably aren't honestly, unfortunately, always made, uh, but but most definitely should be before someone, uh, you know, pulls the trigger on whatever direction they want to go. And yeah, it'll be my honor to to, to understand their perspective and their experience and to share it, um, and to see you know what 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 threads separate us. I think too often we focus on what what separ- what, what is uh, what separates us versus what. Uh, is actually similar between us is actually what I meant to say awkwardly. Uh, but yeah, the commonalities versus, I mean, I meant to say everything I said. So yeah, just in an obscure way. But anyway, my point is, is that I think bodybuilders are weird regardless. Like we do some pretty crazy crap. And even when you do it drug free, it's not necessarily the healthiest thing in the world at certain stages. And, um, you know, what, what separates me uh, besides, you know, 100 pounds of lean body mass from a high level IFBB pro is, is you know, very little when it comes down to it. It's a specific choice. So it, it'll be cool to, to, to talk about the thing we love, lifting weights, and, and then the decision around whether it be enhanced or not. So I'm looking forward to it. Eric, I have a uh, confession. <clears throat> Confess. So I haven't been honest with my drug use. Um, I know I shouldn't do this publicly, but... You know, I, I watched an episode of Oprah discovering yourself and I was just inspired by the, you know, the power of right here, right now. Mm-hmm. And so I want to tell you that I'm not clean. Um, I've actually been using this little known substance called creatine yes. for the last several years. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't call myself a junkie. I'd call myself a user. Okay. A yep. user. Yep. A chronic. I use it every day, actually, uh, probably five grams. Well, at least you're People, not selling it. Not yet. Um, I should say not yet. No, yeah, not yet. 
<laughs> three months, guys. But I, I am a user of creatine. People know of its crazy, insane properties as a supplement uh, where it does assist with uh, power output, with performance in the gym. But there's a lot of questions still surrounding creatine in terms of dosing, whether you need to cycle it or whether you need to uh, load it before when you begin, uh, you know, in terms of the different types where every single year it seems like the supplement companies are promoting a new type of creatine that's supposed to be absorbed faster and better and the efficacy higher than something like the standard creatine monohydrate. Can you just maybe drop some knowledge if we're going to help people make informed choices? Can you drop a little bit of knowledge when it comes to creatine? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of this, I'm sure some people are going to roll their eyes because we have people who are listening to this podcast who for the most part are are pretty committed to the, the iron lifestyle, if you will. Uh, so they're like, yeah, I already know what creatine is. But, you know, just, just to make sure that we cover all the bases, you know, creatine is naturally produced in the human body. Uh, it's from the amino acids, glycine, methionine, and arginine. Um, and we have various energy systems in the body so we can accomplish different tasks and different intensities and different durations. And the phosphocreatine energy system, it's uh, the way we recycle ATP for high intensity efforts and short term repeated efforts like weightlifting or repeated sprints. And uh, it's been repeatedly shown uh, that, that supplementing with creatine can improve lifting performance. And it kind of stands, at least for resistance training, in a class of its own as far as efficacy of supplements. And it's been researched for a long time. It is safe. Um, and the reason why you do have to supplement with it is it's pretty much only present in meat, not even just animal products. And uh, we cook most meat, which degrades the creatine content. So you would have to be eating uh, like pounds of raw meat per day to actually get it in your diet. So, so yeah, if you're smart, you're doing the carnivore diet and you're good to go. And that's the end of this section. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Vegetables are good for you. Um, so the, uh, basically because creatine works so well and it's pretty straightforward and now it's cheap to make, uh, it's, it's put in most supplements, but then the problem is a marketing one. It's no longer an efficacy one. The supplement companies have to figure out how to differentiate and how to make their own creatine stand out. So we're talking since the nineties, we've had different forms of creatine, uh, and we've had different strategies to use it. You will have heard creatine being uh, that you have to take it like old muscle text, like cell tech. You got to take it with a whole lot of carbohydrate and sugar to actually get it loaded into the muscle cell faster. Uh, and that brings us to the standard protocol of loading where over, over four to five days, you'll be taking, you know, five grams every few hours. So you're taking basically 20 to 25 grams a day for four to five days. And this does saturate your creatine stores in your muscle within, you know, less than a week. Um, but the real question is, why does that matter? You don't need to cycle creatine. It's not a hormone. Um, like, like you don't need to cycle creatine anymore. You need to cycle chicken, right? If it's naturally occurring in the body and present in meat. Um, and we have data showing that within a couple of weeks, you're starting to get the supplemental benefits uh, of, of creatine. If you just take a maintenance dose, we're talking three to five grams a day. Uh, and I typically recommend people take, you know, three grams a day or five grams per workout and just skip the loading phase. And people have said, well, hold on, but the loading phase will get me there a few days faster, literally days, I think like a week faster. And, uh, and I'm thinking, well, hold on again, you're going to be lifting for your entire life. So does that matter at all when you're actually using, you know, 100, 100 grams of creatine in five day period? That's like half a bottle when you could extend it out for another two months. It's not expensive, but why waste money? Uh, and more importantly, the few times we do see side effects, which are almost always gastrointestinal, just discomfort, right? Um, it's, it's from loading protocols. It's not from taking a maintenance dose. So uh, you don't need any of that. And, and like we've done a ton of studies on creatine. And, and the cool stuff, the cool thing is that uh, the ISSN, uh, so the International Society of Sports Nutrition, has an open access 2017 position stand on it. So anyone can read this. I think it's by Creator et al. Um, so there's a, there's, you can see that the, the safety, the efficacy, and all the different types of creatine that have been compared is out there. And it's been out there for years. And, man, I remember when I used to take creatine ethyl ester back in, I think, 2005, and then after that was crealkaline, you know, a, a quote unquote buffered form of creatine. And now they've got creatine serum, creatine nitrate. Um, and fortunately, these have all been tested against, tested against the standard uh, creatine monohydrate. And at best, they come out as equal. And some of them are actually, actually inferior. 
Uh, like they, they're not as they're not as bioavailable, not as taken up as well, and they're all more expensive. Um, so so don't buy the marketing hype. Um, I really don't think anyone's going to be improving upon creatine monohyd- monohydrate. There's there's really no issue with it in the first place. Like I said, it's it stands in a class of its own as far as you know dietary supplements go, and, and, and possibly affecting resistance training performance, and then subsequently hypertrophy. So yeah, it's pretty simple. It's a, it's a, Take, take monohydrate if you want, uh, straight up three to five gram per day dose or five gram per workout if you don't want to take it every day or you forget. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, you'll be reaping the benefits, which while pretty high compared to other supplements, it's a supplement. So it's pretty modest. You might not even notice the difference. So, yeah. Eric, I appreciate you supporting my life choices. Um, <laughs> I thought I was going to be faced with ridicule, but I have found a friend. I have found someone that is willing to tolerate my life choices and so for those considering to hop on that creatine i think they're going to be a little bit more informed well hey i I have to admit as well that i haven't stopped taking creatine since 2005 so i wow i've been i'm 14 years on 14 years on exactly yeah yeah which explains my behavior yeah erratic behavior anger Mm -hmm. issues um you think eric's this calm intelligent fellow but uh really when he takes his creatine basically we have to restrain him for about an hour yeah i i go into like these weird rooms and i just like yep. pick up pieces of iron and then put them back down over and over yep. and over again it's uh yeah it doesn't even make sense when you watch it it's yeah. silly no it's like it's almost like you're trying to work against gravity which i don't understand it's a waste why. of time it's a waste no. of time it's just a waste of time. But you know it's not a waste of time this upcoming episode right now uh now of Iron Culture. I hope you guys enjoy it. It's discussing PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. Stick around all the way to the end because I think you're all going to learn a lot and maybe have your perspective changed. Welcome everyone to the Iron Culture podcast. This episode today will be on performance enhancing drugs. I'm joined by my co-host Eric Helms. I'm also joined by two guests today, John Meadows and Mike Isretel, and I want to thank both of them for being on this episode. All right. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. So Eric's going to give a a brief breakdown of who our guests are. We're going to float your boats before we begin uh, because both of you have accomplished a lot in the fitness industry and the lifting industry. You know, some people will say the evidence-based community, what does that even really mean? But you both provide a great utility, I think, to lifters everywhere with the knowledge that you put out. Uh, Mike with Renaissance Periodization, also working with Juggernaut. John Meadows working with uh, uh, Elite FTS, Mountain Dog, his own uh, systems, have contributed over the last 10 years a lot to the community. So just having you both on the channel right now on this episode, we're grateful. Yeah, really appreciate it. And uh, you, John, so you're you're an IFBB pro. I know you've been, I think you turned pro in 2015. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 2015. That's awesome. And since then, you've had some notable placings in the, the 212 class. I think you placed third at the Tampa Pro, top 10 at the Arnold Classic the, the year following in 2016. Yeah, I went crazy, man. When I got my pro card, I had tried for so long. I just went crazy. I think I did... I want to say nine shows in like a year, but I just went crazy. I was like, I'm going to make up for a lot of lost time. So I got, I went right in there and gotten every show I could. And you're, you're in your, your mid forties. Is that correct? I'll be 47 in April. That's awesome, man. I'm also an April baby and I'm turning 36. So I can barely remember. Eric, but yes, yeah, so big you... in the horoscopes, just FYI. That's why we brought up April. I did. We were, we're, we're, we have the same physiology. I've learned that from the stars. So, like I said, evidence-based community, strong, strong here. Um, but you did your first bodybuilding show at the age of 13. So that means you've been a competitive bodybuilder for over three decades. Yeah, man. I mean, there was something wrong with me from the start, right? So, Beautiful. you know, when I was 13, I was just looking at magazines, muscle and fitness and all those things. And as soon as I opened one up, I just said, that's what I want to be. I want to be a pro bodybuilder. I like the way these guys look. And um, <clears throat> it started right there. And awesome. I never really quit. I mean, I, I had a lot of ups and downs over the years, but I just, uh, the bug bit me right there. I made it. I made a goal for myself to be a pro. And um, once I understood what a pro was anyway, and um, that was it, man. I just never stopped. That's that's awesome. And, and I also really appreciate just how... Um, open and honest you are about your experience and you also don't 
overstate it. You always state, hey, this is just my experience. I'm just sharing you know, my personal journey. And, and, and so you can learn from that. But you also don't shy away from uh, you know, keeping yourself learning. I've always respected that about you. I know you have, I think, a bachelor's in health and fitness management. You're a CSCS and also a CISSN. Uh, and I know you coach athletes. So uh, just great to have you on and, and for all those reasons. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You got it. And then we have Dr. Mike Isratel, the Darth Vader to, uh, to, to my Luke Skywalker. And I will always paint it in that much more favorable way for me, although Vader is pretty cool. But, uh, Vader's the fan favorite. That's true. Yeah, Luke, I, I Luke, really shouldn't Luke have done that. Luke is a necessary plot device. Vader is the hero. So can we edit that out? Can I change it? I want to be Vader now. Nope, I feel like I've... <laughs> so heavily implied. Yeah, and I mean, you're older than you. I think time travel is now involved. Is this Terminator or is this Star Wars? I'm very confused. Well, as long as the relationship is more like Star Wars and less like Oedipus, I think we'll all be fine. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's a thinking joke right there, Omar. Well done. Um, yeah. So anyway, Mike Isertel, Dr. Mike Isertel, you're the, uh, the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization. I know you're the, the chief content creator there. You're the, the science behind RP, uh, among many actual uh, PhDs and other people who've, who've, who've done some really great work there. Um, but you got your PhD in sports physiology from ETSU, I think under Dr. Mike Stone. Yep. The very same. Awesome. And I know you were, for a while, you were a professor of exercise science and sports science at, I think, Temple University in, in Philly? Mm-hmm. Awesome. And um, you were, you're were a competitive bodybuilder. Um, you compete in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and you were a longtime competitive powerlifter. And I know you've consulted with athletes in a broad spectrum of sports, um, Olympic athletes, bodybuilders, powerlifters, combat athletes. Um, so, yeah, just honored to have you here. Thank you so much, guys. It's a real honor to be here. Very cool. Very cool. So, Omar, you want to you wanna kick this thing off and, and, and get chatting? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> like we said in our introduction, we want to have a frank and open discussion when it comes to PEDs, performance-enhancing drugs, how, when, why. Uh, I think we probably would want to start with John uh, when it comes to talking about steroids. Like we said before, you've been very open about your use. We want to get into the psychology, the reasons why. You kind of said you were 13 <clears throat> uh, when you first started uh, 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 lifting and uh, competing. What was it about lifting in general that led you down to this path where you are now? Well, I'll give you a little bit of background here. So yeah. I was in a lot of sports and um, I was um, really, really, uh, I don't want to say addicted to hard work, but I really liked to work hard. And I never took study halls in high school or junior high. I always would get special passes to go either run laps around the gym or go to the weight room. I just saw hard work as my way to excel and be a little better at sports. But I also loved bodybuilding. So while I was bodybuilding, I was in football, I was in track. And I just thought all this hard work is a way for me to kind of be better than some of the more gifted athletes. Now, when I started with bodybuilding, I was very, very anti-drug. I was one of those guys that said, you know, remember, you guys don't remember this, but there is a book, Death in the Locker Room by Bob Goldman. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff you know, things being said back then too, that, oh, it'll kill you. You know, you take a few D-ball tablets and you have a heart attack. So I was very, very anti-drug, very anti-drug. I didn't care if anybody else did it, but I just felt like just my, what I had just gathered from uh, sources at that time, I just thought, yeah, this is a road I don't want to go down. And then as I got a little bit older, I, I started to kind of educate myself a little bit. There were some people that, you know, we're writing some books back then, you know, Bill Llewellyn wrote some books, some other guys wrote some books. There was a book called the Anabolic Reference Guide. So I started doing a little bit more research and I started to kind of, you know, put two and two together. And it was like, you know what, maybe there's a responsible way to do this. Maybe, maybe this isn't as bad as I, I thought it was. Now, at the time, you know, I, I was in high school and I was squatting 500 pounds naturally wasn't a real big venture, but I could do probably 225 for set of 10. So I had built what I think was a very respectable foundation. And at the time, I didn't understand the science or any of that kind of stuff. So I just busted my butt. I went to the gym. I didn't fear overtraining. I wasn't worried about doing too much volume. 
all I knew was, was I was going to work my butt off. And I did really well. You know, as a young kid, I did really well. I was, you know, as a high school, I was probably 170 pounds, 175 pounds. I was ex- extremely strong. So I'm telling you that so you can understand like where I was mentally. Mentally, I was, I was kind of a, a guy who wanted to train really hard. I didn't have much science other than I understood kinesiology really well because I was I was obsessed with it. But, you know, I'm 19 years old and I'm doing really good. And I I go to college. And uh, my training partner at the time is like, you know, at that time I had kind of educated myself and he's like, you know, when are you ever going to pull the trigger on this? And so we're talking, you know, I just was in my early 20s and he's like his dad was a veterinarian. Right. So he said, well. I went down and looked in my dad's vet truck last night and I saw he had some Winstrow and Equipoise. And I, at that time, I like I had already started reading and I was like, OK, Winstrow, that's good stuff. And hell, if it's good enough for a horse, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so I um, I got a bottle of Winstrow, it was a 30 cc Upjohn bottle of Winstrow. And that was my cycle for the show I did. Um, so if you can, if you let me just put that into perspective, what, what that is. So. Each milliliter is a 30 milliliter bottle. bottle. Each milliliter is 50 milligrams. Okay. I took it every other day. So I took 50 milligrams every other day. So it lasted me 60 days. I used that for a contest. It was the only drug I used. I used nothing else. No uh, clenbuterol, no fat burners, no growth hormone, nothing. That was all I took. And my body got really hard. I mean, it really just changed dramatically. And I, and I was now keep in mind, I'm in my early 20s. And I'm and I get in men's open shows. I'm smashing all the men. I'm winning the overall in every show I'm doing with perfect scores. And that was the only thing I took. Now, if you tell a guy nowadays, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, anybody listening to this podcast would probably think it's impossible to win a show on a bottle of Winstrol. But that's what I did, and I re- I responded very very well to it. It was great. And um, once I got a little bit later in my twenties, I tried a little bit of testosterone. I started training at Westside Barbell and I was powerlifting at the time. And by that point, my squad had shot up over 700 pounds. And so I did what I thought was a really intense stack. I, uh, I, I decided to put a little test in there at 500 milligrams. I took a two and a half CC shot of Scipionate every Saturday and 500 milligrams to me, I was like really pushing the limits. Now the guys will take 500 milligrams a day. Um, but back then it was like, you know, it's funny looking back, but I I try to explain this to people. They don't believe me. They're like, there's no way you had to more. I really didn't. And, um, you know, so I got educated through the years when I I got much, when I had won regional shows and stage shows, I actually had done, uh, the uh, one pro qualifier, my second pro. So my approach was I'd started with something very little. And I had a really good foundation. And then I just kind of added it a little bit as I want. Um, you know, so it was when I was in my 30s, you know, I was taking a little bit more, obviously. But it was amazing to me how you could get so much out of so little. And I think that's kind of the disconnect we have now uh, is there's so much bad information out there, guys, that they think they need to take these mega doses and 10 different drugs at once. And the reality is, is you really don't have to. You can get crazy results off of just testosterone. It's a very powerful chemical. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's, um, I appreciate you guys doing this because there's a lot of people that I wish somebody would tell them, man, you don't need to do all that. You can do really fine. If you really fine tune your diet, you fine tune your training, you actually bust your butt and you work hard. You, you know, forget about, uh, forget about all the nonsense, man. Just get in there, work hard. And, and, you know, that stuff is, it's going to help you, no doubt about it, but just be a little bit more intelligent about it. No, I really appreciate that you said that, John. I think there are, there are, are, are communities on the internet that widely believe that it is actually impossible to even get a 500 pound squat or to, you know, be able to, to, to bench over three plates without yeah, without chemical assistance. And that's just simply not something that can occur at all. And I think that creates this, this belief that I run into probably a lot more than you. I know you, like you were mentioning how people don't believe you that you took only this amount. There are, you know, it's a whole community that believes you can't even do anything drug free that's worthwhile without drugs at all. And I think we, we lose that middle ground. We lose that conversation. And so I'm, I'm really glad you came on. I, 
I guess the question I have for you is, um, is someone who's deciding to become a, a, an IFBB professional bodybuilder, the choice they make, in my mind, it's very different than the choice that someone makes who has no competitive aspirations at all and is just deciding to take gear. I, in my mind, as, as a natural bodybuilder, I can totally understand if someone says, hey, my goal is the Olympia, my goal is IFBB Pro, my goal is to see how far I can take it. But I have a really tough time understanding uh, the choice people make who are not trying to go that route. Um, and I think some of those, those folks are looking at IPB pros and seeing it at the same thing. Do you see it as the same or, or when, when do you think not that there's a right or wrong answer here is, is appropriate for someone to actually seriously consider anabolics? I think the interesting thing to look at there is the psychology, uh, you know, so I wanted to be a pro, but I knew at some point I figured out in order for me to be a pro, I have to do this stuff. There's just no way around it. But I think what's interesting is I, I agree and I disagree. I think that there are people who might want to just not compete. Uh, maybe maybe they don't want to shave their legs and get in a tanning booth and do all that. Mm -hmm. But they want to push their limits. They want to see what their body's capable of. So I can see that. But. What I have, what I think is bizarre is I think a lot of the population, Eric, they just, they don't do it because they love training. They just think if I can take some drugs, I'll look really good. I'll be really popular on Instagram. And I don't think those are the people who really, really, truly love the sport, okay. you know? So I'm a, I'm a throwback, right? I mean, I really love bodybuilding. So I've seen a lot of people come and go. And now with social media, the way it is, and by the way, I love social media, but the way it is now, people, you know, I was talking to a guy that has, uh, I think he's up to 2 million followers last week, and he's on pretty hard cycles year round. He's told me I'm scared to death to come off because then I won't look good for Instagram. And I think the culture around the sport is kind of changing. And these guys are so afraid to not look awesome all the time. And, and the reality is, is when you do this kind of stuff, in order for you to stay healthy, you have to pull back, right? You have to take time off. You have to do those kinds of things. So you may not look 100% all the time. And so I think, I mean, I have a hard, I, what I have a hard time with, Eric, is those kind of folks. It's the folks who are just kind of doing it just to look good, but they don't really have a passion. I'm not saying they're bad people. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying I can't really identify with that because to me, it was a tool to help you. And I hate taking shots, man. You know, so I never really liked that part, but I knew I would have to do that. I knew it was a tool that I needed to get to the pro level. Yeah, I, I can completely relate to that. I, I And like you, I don't think they're bad people either. I just, I legitimately worry about them. They're doing something that for, for like the, when, when your reasons going into something are, are like that, when they, they lack the, the long-term consideration and they're almost based on fear rather than, like you said, using them as a tool. Like if I don't stop doing this, I won't have my business. That leads to some really poor decisions. And as much as maybe we, in, in the 80s and 90s, the, the danger of anabolic use was overplayed, it's not like they, they don't have side effects. So I guess what I want to dovetail my next question, and, uh, and, and Mike, feel free to jump in here as, as kind of the voice of, of science here, is how, like what is the level of, of side effects and risk that is associated with uh, anabolic use at, at both the level where, you know, someone's just taking a small amount recreationally to what you might have to do to be a successful IPV pro. <laughs> well, let me tip it off here and then I'll hand it over to Mike. It's highly variable. First of all, you know, you've got guys that can get away with taking a lot of stuff for whatever reason. Then you have guys that can't, it's very, I mean, it's variable. I can give you an idea, you know, I always, I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Serrano take care of me and, you know, we do blood work two to three times a year. I've had calcium score tests done on my heart. I've had, I mean, we're very thorough. We want to see everything. So, you know, to me, it's, it's hard. I can't sit here and say, well, if you take this, you'll be okay. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Or I can't say if you take all that stuff, you're going to get hurt. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. What I can say is, you should at least be mindful. You should at least get basic blood work done. Um, 
you know, that stuff, man, I, I've got a stack of blood work as tall as I am. Well, not that I'm that tall, but um, so I was vo- always very, very mindful of that. Um, so, I'll, you know, I'll pass it over to Mike, but that's that's kind of how I look at that. Yeah, I think that's a real good place to start is there are no guarantees in either direction. And uh, some people just respond pretty well and some pretty poorly. I will say that another complexity is you can respond well in the short term and not very well in the long term, which is really messed up. But you just can't assume that because you're okay now, you're going to continue to be okay. Uh, You could be doing great, doing great, doing great. Your labs even come back good. And all of a sudden, the doctors are like, your heart's pretty much going to die. You need a new heart. (laughs) Um, So now doing blood work, especially detailed blood work, is a very good uh, sort of bulwark against that. But it's not foolproof. So you're always taking a risk. Um, Now, on that note, let's say we just take the average response as far as risk is concerned and total magnitude of effect over your life on health. There's definitely some distinct strata you can draw. Um, The first strata I would draw is uh, a cycle of orals 30 days before you go to a music festival or a beach or like John's first show, you know, Winstrol for 60 days before a show at, you know, 25 milligrams a day. I mean... Anyone who tells you that outside of a real freak situation, that's going to affect your longevity in some kind of market way is just lying. Um, It's almost completely innocuous at that point for almost everybody. And, you know, it'll be a pretty cool thing. Like, it's like, you know, sort of like taking creatine at that point. It's just super powerful. And uh, then the next thing is you start um, pushing cycles, distinct cycles, uh, of injectables and getting into the sort of, I would call it the 500 milligram to 1000 milligram weekly dosage range. You're dealing with some real serious trade-offs there, but if you are intelligent about your decisions and pull back when you have to push when you must, then you can get, you know, very close to full longevity and health for a real long time. And I think in, in, in including that I would put in low dose, low dose growth hormone use and very, very responsible insulin use. Um, the thing that'll kill you the fastest there is that taking all that and eating like you should be, if you're taking, it's going to make you so big that the size will kill you way before the dosage as well. Um, So, you know, weighing 250 is way worse for your health than running all that shit for years. Um, And then there's what I would call probably the the third stratum or the IFBB pro meat and potato stratum, which is a sum total of between a gram and three, three and a half grams of total gear per week on average, (laughs) which means you have some low times, you have some high times. That is the range in which you're, you're saying, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years at the end of my life, I'm just not really interested in living on average. I'm taking a serious chunk and I'm, I'm really exposing myself to some legit risks, but they can, for some people be informed and calculated risks. You know, we don't live in a totalitarian society where people have to live as long as possible. You can choose quality of life, which is determined subjectively over longevity. I think that's fine. So there are people who uh, probably most of the people I would think uh, who are going to win IFBB shows and going to the Olympia are probably in that range uh, somewhere, some at the lower end, some at the higher end. And of course, there's exceptions. But a lot of those folks, they have coaches that are good enough to tell them, like, look, just be reasonable and let's do blood work and you're not going to do this shit forever. So a lot of them are like, yeah, I'm out, I'm retiring, and, and that's totally cool. Then I would, uh, the top end of that range, uh, the, the fourth stratum, I would call it, is like the Rich Piana insanity range of where. You just take drugs recreationally to push the limits, not with training, but with drugs. Um, And that's when people are like, I'm smashing seven grams a week. And you're like, I don't know what to tell you other than you're insane. Uh, And again, like John said, some of those guys do that shit for 10 years, come out squeaky clean, live till they're 80. I'm sure there's multiple guys from the 80s. John might know some of these people personally that did unspeakable things. I mean, I've heard of people in the 80s passing D-balls in their stool because they were eating so many D-ball tabs. They couldn't digest them physically. Uh, and, and which, you know, like that's a lot of drugs and and those people are still fine today. So some people dodge the bullet, but if someone was to tell me, Hey, I want to do a couple of, you know, a cycle of Anavar before a music festival, I'd be like, okay, I'm judging you for making this interesting decision, which I don't think anyone should take drugs unless they're real serious about some shit, but I think it's fine. You're fine. You're not going to die or whatever. If you're interested in informed use up to a thousand milligrams a week on average, I think, you know, if the trade-offs are right and you're very good about it and you do blood work, okay. I think that if you take between a gram and three grams, uh, three and a half grams, you had better be competing in bodybuilding or strong that or something. If you're not competing and you're using drugs like that, ah, sure, you know, I'm a libertarian, you do whatever you want. 
you're not going to get my nod of approval for it. I'm just gonna be like, you're out of your fucking mind. Uh, and then the uh, three and a half gram plus range is just, I'll put it to you this way. If you have to take more than three and a half grams a week on average to like place that, like to, to, to win nationals or to place at nationals to go to a pro qualifier, man, I just find a different hobby. No joke. Uh, because you're probably going to get you in a lot of real serious health trouble. So I think if just understanding the strata there and when you see a guy talking about drugs, you're like, he's in that strata and his decisions are concomitant with not being in that strata and he's making a, a bad decision versus someone that's like, yeah, I'm running two grams a week, but I'm a sponsored IFBB professional. I've won three shows. This is my career. This is my life. I want to make a great family and grandchildren and stuff, even though I might not get to see them much at the end of my life. This is my calling. It's my passion and I'm not giving up. I'm doing it as responsibly as possible. Hey, sweet. But it, it just has to be a known thing. The worst thing, and probably John can speak to this more, is when people enter the, the fray of drugs and they just like read cycles on bodybuilding.com, which is exactly where you should get all of your drug information, in my opinion. And uh, they read like they probably make belief cycle. I don't even know where these come from. Like, you know, like this was Lee Haney's cycle. Like, how the fuck do you know that? So uh, they'll read shit like that and they'll just sort of be like, yeah, like three grams is just what it takes. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like that's not even remotely true. So I think a lot of people, and this is something I, I don't know if it's a place for me to rant about this, but. Maybe lately, maybe always, certainly as, as I mature more as a person who interacts with people as man, a coach or mentor or something, I've been getting increasingly more impressed at the intractability of advice to people that are potentially seeking it. And what I mean by that is like people message me like, hey, I want to take drugs. Should I? I'm like, no, they're like, OK, I'm going to take drugs. What should I take? I'm like minimum doses. And they're like, OK, so I'm going to do like three grams a week. And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. Some people that just it, just shit just doesn't happen in there. And they just uh, they just want just to bull rush just the stupidest shit ever. And they have the ultimate weapon against any reasonable advice. Their weapon is I want to be the best now. It's diff if someone does not have the requisite maturity, like from my understanding, John didn't turn pro until he was like in his 40s or something like almost no one is that dedicated and diligent and actually loves competing and eating and training enough. To even do that, they want to like be a pro like tomorrow and and you're going to tell them, hey, there's all these bad things that happen later, but they don't have the sort of mental framework or interest in thinking long term. So when someone's uninterested, in, it's like it's like probably it's like someone who doesn't know what a bad it, someone who doesn't believe it's bad to kill people. They put a gun to someone's head and you're like, don't do that. That's bad. And they're like, I don't agree with you. And you're like, I, I guess fire away. I don't know what to tell you. So when they're like, hey, I'm going to shoot myself with grams of drugs. And you're like, don't do that long term. They're like, I don't care about the long term. You're just like, yeah, I got nothing for you, man. And I literally don't know. Maybe the sport culture has to change, but some people it just you just can't get to them. So there's my pessimistic, rosy outlook. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I, I appreciate summary. that. That is a great summary. And I, from my perspective, those stratas and those levels that Mike pointed out, I think those are really accurate. I think that's a, I think that's very good. Can I uh, just rewind, gentlemen, for a second uh, to get some definitions out of the way so we can all be on the same page? And also for the listeners out there, I'd want to ask Mike this question, uh, dropping the science. Can you first define what a PED is? And we've used some terminology now where I believe uh, there's a drug called Winstrolk. Mike, can you define what PEDs are, steroids, and then also give a brief overview of some of the more common ones? Totally. Um, regular supplements you get at your GNC, PEDs are the thing that the guy in the trench coat behind the GNC is like, hey, you want to see something cool? You're like, well, gee whiz, mister, I, I want to be the best on my baseball team. And he's like, well, he opens up a trench coat, you know, hopefully he's not the flasher again. Yeah, yeah. Um, awkward. awkward. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I've seen this before, sir. You don't <laughs> no, have not impressed. It's, 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 it's not impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, are different than supplements almost always because they have some uh, level of government control on them. So you can't simply access them, which means you almost always have to get them through the black market uh, and or pull some strings to get them not through the black market. There's a couple of classes of PEDs. There's a lot of PEDs that just kind of like they're used in bodybuilding, but they're used in so many other sports. They don't get uh, a good look like there's some advanced stimulants and stuff, which people take like cyclists, by the way, have a, have a, a monopoly on PEDs. They've left bodybuilders behind years ago. There's some shit cyclists do that. I'm like, what the fuck is that even? And they're like, you don't want to know. Um, but uh, the ones that are more relevant to bodybuilding and lifting are, are basically a couple of classes of drugs. 
there's uh, anabolic androgenic steroids, which can be either oral or injectable. And they're like basically versions of testosterone that work a little bit differently. So it's like everything you get out of testosterone, you get some degree of that from them. Uh, there is a growth hormone, which is also injectable, and that's considerably more expensive, more exotic. Very few people use growth hormone relative to androgens because it's like an order of magnitude price difference. Growth hormone has a, a bit of a different risk ratio profile. It's milder generally, unless you do dumb shit with it, which people do. Then there's insulin, which you take concomitantly with those other two, that is a very good anabolic agent, but it comes with a, the, the most acute danger because if you OD your insulin, you can actually die unbelievably rare, I'll have to say, that you have to be just straight up real dumb to do that. But there's plenty of those people in, in the sport, so, you know, what am I saying? Uh, and then, I don't know, what am I missing? John, there's probably some, like, fat burner types, coin butyrol. Yeah, that. that kind of stuff. And, you know, from the competitive aspect, the real danger, or the, the, the thing that's hurt most people is the diuretics, obviously. The irresponsible diuretic use. And, and, not, and everybody, and these guys, these coaches think they have a way to use diuretics, but it's incredibly unpredictable based on the state your body's in at the time. So I'd probably throw that in. And then Mike, you know, we've seen different kinds of side enhancement over the years. The old acyclean type chemicals that probably aren't around anymore. And now we have these different kinds of side enhancement uh, things that make people look like these weird looking blow up dolls with no muscle separation, which is an absolutely awful look. So yeah, there's a, there's a chemical uh, plethora of drugs that are used. And I would even throw an EPO, you throw in cyclists. I remember I played around with EPO, I don't know, 15, 17 years ago. I mean, it's, it, I always thought it was kind of interesting to try all these different things. But, man, there are a lot, to Mike's point, there are a lot of different things in the bodybuilding world. Hmm. And I guess that there are, uh, there are risks beyond just not living as long and, and making those calculated decisions about your personal life like, uh, like you, you spoke to, Mike. Um, I, from what I've heard, uh, IFBB pros at a certain point are pretty much guaranteed to have to be on, on HRT or people taking that dosage level at a certain point. Is, is, is that, is that, is that a thing is permanent shutdown of, of the, of the HPT access? Uh, is, is that, is that real? Uh, yeah. John, oh, yeah. To, to more of seeing this in the, in the real world. It's again, to John's earlier point, it, it really is luck of the draw. Some guys can come cold turkey off of five grams a week for 10 years. And like in two months, they're like, I'm great. And you're like, fuck you. Some people run relatively mild cycles. And after their first period of total shutdown, which everyone gets if you run a cycle over a couple of months long, uh, they just never come back. So it's, it's real luck of the draw type stuff. A lot of that is actually reflected in uh, um, gonadal size, you know, like so your, your te testicles, like to the extent that they shrink and your ejaculate volume goes down, that's probably not a good sign. Uh, some people's balls almost completely disappear, but not, you know what I'm saying? Your boy, my shit, I'm golden. But anyway, uh, no, but some people it's like not really a thing. So um, it's definitely a risk uh, you're dealing with. Probably the, the the biggest factor of that risk that people don't think about it if they use it when they're young is potential uh, total infertility when they're older. Uh, now, like you can still inject test for very low rates uh, for the rest of your life. There's one one produce test anymore. Who cares? This is needle and guinea test. Almost completely. It's almost free. It's how cheap it is to shoot replacement doses. But if you cannot have children based on decisions you made early in your life, like isn't that the ultimate like? You should have been smarter when you were younger type shit. Like you were mm. 20, you tend to a ton of gear. You met the woman of your dreams in your 30s. It's a different time in your life. You have a career. You want a family. And the doctors are like, man, you're just not having a family because your nuts basically fell off. And you're like, all right, that's sweet. So that's, a, a, again, again, another category of something that, that folks don't think about. And a lot of people who are very interested in making bad decisions, particularly young people, uh, they don't think down the road like that. They're like, you know, when you're 20, do you want kids? Probably not. You're like, fuck that. I hate kids. And then you meet the woman of your dreams and you have, you know, like all of us here a little older, like you, your interest in having a family definitely, it probably has an inflection point at some point, but it definitely escalates over the years. And then you could find yourself in a position where that's not the case. Um, and then, and then what, you know? So a lot, like you said, a lot of this is, uh, is definitely, it's definitely a factor. And in addition to really quick, um, one of the risks is a quality of life reduction during the time that you're using drugs. Drug use, is, it comes with its elements of that are fun, I suppose, but a lot of it's just not fun at all. 
uh, the, you know, a lot of people, especially if you run a lot of gear, you're in a state of sort of semi-psychosis at all times. It's kind of like losing your mind to some extent. Uh, some people get it much worse than others. It's, it's definitely not fun. There's only in almost everyone you have an escalation and in, 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 uh, irritability that it's just consistently dose dependent. So if you're on a lot of gear, you're just like, oh, yeah, fuck. Like you're like eating dinner and you're watching TV and you're like, oh, man, fuck, I feel like I should be doing something else. Like what's next? Uh, what's next on my schedule? Maybe something else will be fun. And it's like an inability to enjoy uh, being in the moment, which which is real rough. And it's like, people are like, oh man, I'm going to take a shitload of trend and I'm going to be on Instagram and I'm going to be a celebrity and I'm going to have this great life. Like half the people taking those Instagram pictures, they take the picture and they compulsively upload it and they watch the likes increase and they're like, oh, this is great. Oh uh, uh, yeah. What am I doing next? Uh, I don't know. And it's just like, do you want to live like that? Fuck no. Uh, but they don't know that, right? The, 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 a lot of people on the internet assume that this is all just like you take the shit, you turn into a balloon animal freak and everything else is great. It's the half the, half the side effects are terrible while you're using it so it's, it's one of those real black box that's such uh, uh, sorts of things or maybe like one fine point I'd, I'd like to bring to this podcast is it is never a whatever decision to use anabolic agents it is a big decision it is a very thoughtful decision it has to be a thoughtful decision for it to be a good one i hate when and this is not as i don't think it's as prevalent in the united states in europe in the middle east it's like ubiquitous to just consider anabolics as just something you, it's just like, it's just like creatine to a lot of folks over there. Like, oh, I tried creatine, now I tried D-ball. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's not the same category of drug. So it, it, if I can just like parlay anything, it's like, this is a serious thing. And it's not just serious later, it's serious now. Uh, and a lot of people just don't feel like that. And it's it's always very strange to me. They're just uh, this sort of careless sort of like uh, dilettante use of very powerful drugs is always just bad. Like I, I've talked to guys in the gym. I was talking to a guy one time, a long time ago. And he's like, you know, people like when you're big enough, people just start drug conversations with you. <laughs> John, I'm sure you've so yeah, gotten your share of that. Like they just volunteer their cycle. And this guy must have weighed like 160 pounds. Uh, and he was like five, seven. Right. And he was not lean. So I was like, all right. And he was like, yeah, fucking trends kicking in. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> and I was like, trend he's like yeah i figured you know like want to get jack i'm like oh my god <laughs> like it, it's just unbelievable that some people just it's the carelessness and the the casual nature with which they approach these which is really what to me is just really scary i don't know i'd love to hear your thoughts on that john if you have any well i go back to the psychological part of this you know you mentioned on instagram people looking at the likes they're getting these little dopamine hits they're like oh yeah it's like an addiction for him and you know, for me, I think, again, it was always just a tool. I had a situation where I got really sick in 2005, had a very rare disease, had a lot of surgeries, came back from that, and I had lost 60 pounds from being in the hospital. And I went into the gym, and I remember getting on a leg extension machine. I was happy as hell to be there. And I remember I could do a leg extension with one plate, so the very top plate. I don't know if it was 20 pounds or 40 pounds, but that's all I could do. And one of the trainers came over there and she was a friend of mine. She was like, you know, hey, I, wow, you're back. And she's like, I didn't think you'd come in here so soon. I was like, why would you say that? She's like, well, you know, you're just so small now. I was like, are you kidding? And I'm like, I'm super happy to be in here. I, I mean, this is I'm like thrilled right now. But psychologically, like I love to be in there. And, you know, so you get guys that are. They're really self-absorbed, and I, I went through those phases in my 20s where you just get bodybuilding as your life. You're really self-absorbed. You have a hard time picturing a family and things like that. But then there comes a point in time, you know, you're winning titles or, or, or not winning titles. But for me, it was winning titles, and I was like, is this it? Is this all life has to offer, you know? And then, you know, you get a little bit older. Like you said, Mike, you meet somebody, you think about kids. I've got two kids now. I can't even imagine personally life without my kids. Um, and that's when I was in my 20s. I, I didn't really think about all that. I was just like, no one's going to stop me. I'm going to be a pro. And there, here's the reality. The reality was that when I had a more balanced life, I did even better. One of the biggest lies that I hear is that you can't be a great bodybuilder and also have a life like like you can't have a job. I used to hear people say that. Well, they, well, muscle tech wouldn't pick me up. So, you know, I don't have any money. I'm like, why don't you get a job? They're like, oh, you can't be a bodybuilder and have a job. What? You guys yeah. are just a bunch of lazy, no good. So 
I never understood that. I worked a corporate job. I worked a lot of hours for Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. I traveled. They had me on the road all the time. I'd go to the Nationals, compete, fly back home Sunday. Monday, I was back to work. I'd get off work. I'd go train. Like, I don't understand why you can't do that. So, you know, I think uh, I think people are – they get, I guess – I know I'm kind of just going off the rails here, but I think people are really self-absorbed. They don't they kind of lose track of, of life and what's going on. And um, at some point, you know, uh, Mike mentioned the kids thing. Sometimes then they're going to be like, oh, boy, I never thought of that. So, you know, there's you can be a bodybuilder. You can be intelligent. You can have a life. You can do all those things. You don't need to alienate everybody around you. You know, I've been saying that for years. It's funny, man. When I go to seminars, I talk for three days on my workshops. And I think the part that people like the most is they say, wow, I had no idea I could actually like have a life. Like I can actually go out and eat every now and then with my family. I can do these kinds of things. I'm like, yeah, man. So, but people are generally in shock when I tell them that. John, can you get a little bit into the culture, the mindset over the last 25 years in regards to lifters, steroids, steroid culture? Has it changed at all with, you know, social media taking over, the motivations, just, you know, the degree? What's your experience been from, you know, the mid 90s to now? when it comes to the culture? Yeah, man, it's very different. So we didn't have, obviously we didn't have social media in the late eighties and in the nineties. So you didn't, you couldn't impress anybody on Instagram. You went to the gym because you wanted to impress yourself. You wanted to work hard. Typically you had some guys you trained with, you had your little gym gang and you guys all pushed each other really hard. You you all were, you're all bonded. You're really cool with each other. Maybe go out to eat afterwards. We always went to a buffet across the street and ate as much as we could stand. Um, but you really loved it and the drug part, you know, you went to shows and you talked about with other competitors and you had these little side conversations. That's how you would learn. Of course you had the conversations in the gyms too. You had that. Um, so you were dealing with people who, um, had a lot of experience that were doing it. You go to shows and then as times kind of changed, these personalities started coming out of the woodwork that started claiming these fantastic things where all of these pros take side enhancement oil, all of these pros take 10 grams a week. And the young people never saw the eighties and nineties. So their first experience was like, Oh, this guy's finally telling the truth. I'm like, no, this guy's actually full of, he's full of it. Now he doesn't know. I know all these pros take all this. And I'm like laughing, like, no, you don't. (laughs) Um, and so the culture started to change. The culture became that's when the that's when kind of the uh, the scientific part of this and being smart about it kind of went out the window. And then social media kind of came along and kind of built up that the I want to do it now, as Mike said, this has got to happen overnight. So now you've got people who have they want it overnight. They have to have it. And then they've got bad information on top of that. And then they've got this this uh, the dopamine addiction to getting hits on Instagram and all this stuff kind of culminates and it turns into this. Um, then you have people that live their life just based on impressing other people. And that's very, very different than the 80s and 90s. And um, it's unfortunate because I think social media is a fantastic tool. I think it can be great. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's very different. You know, it's, it's just – so much of what I hear there is that uh, the people who tend to be a little more okay are doing this for intrinsic reasons. They're doing it uh, because they have a goal that they're, like you said, they're trying to impress themselves. They're trying to show themselves what they can accomplish and take it as far as they can. And it's not about uh, the approval of others. I mean, obviously there can be a competitive desire, but in the end, like you said, there's, there's a deeper connection. You love being in the gym. It wasn't being in the gym at 220 pounds, you know? And I, um, I always like to say to people that an enhanced bodybuilder and a natural bodybuilder have more in common than they have different. There's that one thing that's different, but you know, if if you ever listen to the 3d muscle journey podcast, we, if anything, we discourage people from casually competing because whether you do it drug free or on drugs, competitive bodybuilding is, is at a certain point unhealthy, you know, And, and when you're pushing yourself to essential levels of body fat and you know, you're, I like to tell people like, and they say, Oh, you're competing this year. And like, yeah, I'm going to see how many eating disorders I can get, you know? And, um, you know, it's, it's competitive starvation. You're pushing yourself to the limit, like any sport really, but in a, in a way that is much more pervasive and unescapable. And that's, that's drug free, you know? And I think 
uh, one thing where we've done on this podcast is we've had a number of people speak to the history of bodybuilding and how, you know, bodybuilding came out of physical culture and physical culture was originally about pushing yourself and expressing yourself through exercise. And I think anytime you decide to compete, you do realize you have to kind of consider that there is a, there's a trade-off to some degree. And the trade-off is not even, it's not even recommended. Like if someone is super, super motivated about bodybuilding, loves it. And my first thing I, I would tell them to do is be like, yeah, lift as hard as you can, push yourself, but there's no reason you need to get on stage. And I think it's, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but it's even another level to say, okay, if I am going to compete, then I would say, well, my, my first recommendation would be to do it drug free. There, there, there are outlets for that. Um, because it's, I don't, I mean, not, that I'm saying it's better, but I would say there is a certain, another level of commitment and sacrifice if you do decide to compete, um, and try to be competitive in, in, in an enhanced, a non-tested organization or try to get your IPB pro card. I don't know. Do you guys agree with that? Oh yeah. So I was, uh, at, uh, uh, the, the summit that John Gorman puts on him and, um, and I told him and Cliff, man, I have tremendous amount of respect for you and Alberto and you guys, because as a natural coach, you can't just throw drugs at a problem. If somebody's metabolism is um, going downhill, you can't just throw T3 at it. You have to, there's another level of um, science, really, you have to understand. And there's even more art to it. And it is an art, too. And I competed many, many years, those early years, natural. And I still, to this day, half my clientele is natural. And I always appreciated that because it forced me to think. And you know, one of the things that's kind of disappointing to me is there's not a lot of talk about training. And, you know, you have guys like Mike talking about max recoverable volume and that kind of stuff. Those conversations never, they don't really exist outside of a handful of people. This is why I appreciate things like things like that that Mike does. But what happens is you get people that are training and they, they're taking a lot of drugs, so they get good results. So they go, well, this is how you should train. Actually, you can get away with very, you know, very unstructured, poor program by taking drugs because guess what? They work. You know, you have protein synthesis just through the roof all the time. There's all kinds of things that happen that very anti-catabolic. So there wasn't there's really not a lot of science. The science uh, is not it's where it wasn't isn't where it should be, in my opinion, when it comes to training. And that's because you got all these people to just it's everything is so uh, it's so effective when you take drugs. It kind of throws out the science and people go, wow, yeah. You know, I just do this and it works awesomely. Well, yeah, try that on natural and see how it works. You know, I've been there. Um, so I have a tremendous amount of respect for the natural coaches. And I think in many, many ways, they're, they're, uh, that's, who I would, if, that's who I would want to coach me because they can help you figure out, okay, I've been lowering my calories, my basal metabolic rates going down the tubes now. Now what do I do? I can't just throw T3 at it. I can't just throw Clan at it. I can't just do those things. I got to actually fix this fix this through my diet, my rest and things like that. So, you know, I'm one of those guys, I think I probably got more appreciation for the natural coaches than maybe any other coach out there. So I think it's, uh, I think they're very good at what they do. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you, John. Uh, man, there's a, there's a, uh, a thing that happens in the, the non-natural coaching community or the social media world around the top coaches, so to speak. There's this thing where if you work with a coach and they've produced, quote unquote, a lot of really good talent, um, they can always throw you the following sort of buy in, which is here's what you need to take. And you may look at it and go, holy pharmacy, Christ, are you serious? And their infant looks like this. I coached him. This is what he took. This is what all my athletes take. It's what it takes. And. A lot of like I literally know I'm not going to name names, um, but uh, there's guys who really just copy other coaches in one and a half times their gear. And guess what? Their athletes get better results. The ones that are alive and the ones that don't quit sport permanently from being like, you know, I'm done with all this shit. I don't even know my own name anymore. Um, and the ones that don't get heart surgery, et cetera. So that's the difference is that with the drug free coach. You just got to know your shit to some extent or you just don't make people look good. And then, you know, the, the I suppose the only sort of 
fall back with drug free coaching that still isn't open or whole for this is just diet people harder and longer and you'll get everyone's triad glutes and it doesn't matter if they shit their fucking career off at the other end whatever but with but you can do that with drug sport you can do that that and you can do that with just more gear and um you know, there's that retort to the, well, isn't this just a lot? Isn't this irresponsible? Is like, how do you think championships are won? And then you go hire a coach like John and he slashes your gear by a third and you do a little better in your next show. And you're like, I've been ripped off for five years straight spending how God knows how much money on tons of gear and just pissing away my health and all these side effects because these guys told me like, this is what it takes. It, it's so funny because there's a lot of bodybuilding pros and a lot of these gurus in the pro scene where they're like, I like to use this superset to target. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Shut up. You don't know how to train. There's tons of bodybuilders that legitimately don't know how to lift weights. They don't know what full range of motion is. They say the word mind muscle connection. They're like, I really like to feel connected on these dumbbell presses. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I want to train and everything has a purpose and everything is through the great, great range of motion. And if you can see, like, he's doing flies, his pecs are like, you can see in there. And these other guys, like, they say this, they, I'm, I'm going for the stretch on these flies. And they're going to here. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with your pecs? That's a stretch. And they're like, they, they're like, oh, yeah, today's a high carb day. Like, carbs, shut up. Like, I the drug advice, but you don't even have this advice. This is the advice of a coach you had two years ago. You just copied his plan and you're reselling it to people and just multiply everything by one and a half. That that's like kind of like the sort of the I don't know, maybe the worst part of the the serious drug bodybuilding community is just a bunch of fucking clowns and people who listen to them simply because they're super jacked and they're like, if I listen to that fucking clown idiot, I'll be jacked. And they're right in the short term. And in the long term they're like, Yeah, my kidneys don't work anymore, but that's the sport. And then John over here is kicking it at age 47. He's probably going to be jacked for another 10 years. And you're like, oh, I wonder how he's just lucky or whatever. It's like, it's not luck. You were just always a fucking idiot. And man, sorry. So tell us how you really feel, man. I like that. Well, I'm <laughs> glad you said that. Because here's how I really feel. <laughs> now, now that we're off camera. No, I was going to say, if we uh, can back up then for a second, because, John, we've heard your perspective, your journey, your decision to use uh, anabolic steroids. Eric, I actually want to ask you a quick question because we can have a, a, another perspective here. As a natural bodybuilder, you've chosen the drug-free route. Can you talk a little bit about your career and those choices and what made you decide not to? Because I would assume for every point, regardless if you are enhanced or not enhanced, it is a question that one must ask themselves in their training journey. I think every single lifter at some, question, uh, at some point uh, has the question, considers it, and then ultimately makes a choice. Yeah, so... I made the decision, well, I, I should start at the beginning. So I got into lifting in around 2004, and rarely are you exposed to natural body, bodybuilding first thing if you get into like muscle magazines or, or lifting and all that. Like I watched Pumping Iron, like you kind of go, you work, like you get exposed to it. I, I read Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, and I was like, oh, let's learn more about Arnold. I watched Pumping Iron, and then I started reading Muscular Development, um, and for, for my understanding was always that there's this obligatory need to eventually take take anabolics and i think i watched like the hbo real sports one where john Mon was like well, where are the bodies like and they paint a very very rosy picture of anabolics and and i even remember sitting down with my family at one point and this was around the time where i was kind of having that consideration of which which way do i want to go and do i want to compete and all those things and i smugly sat there i think i was 20 years old and it knew nothing and only been lifting for a year and a half. And I was like, well, the only side effects are, you know, acne and balding. And, uh, you know, like, so it's just, I, I was kind of like that stereotypical internet expert before I was on the internet. Um, and then I think the difference for me was, was two things, one self-awareness and two, probably the right timing, uh, not the right timing, but the timing that, that allowed me to, to make a more informed choice. I got online with bodybuilding.com right around the time where, um, I think the WBF and Lane Norton and a few of these people were getting a little more popularity and uh, natural bodybuilding and fitness magazine had popped up and I was working as a trainer in Georgia and I got asked by a friend of mine who kind of introduced me to some more thoughtful approaches to bodybuilding and an older gentleman who used to be Mr. Alaska way back in the day. And he asked me to come judge at a IMBF show as a test judge because I was a bodybuilding fan. And he thought, you know, they always need judges. It's 
it's a thankless job and there's never enough of us. So I, I test judged, which means I sat, my, my votes didn't count, but if they lined up enough with the rest of the judges, then I would have became an official uh, INBF judge. Um, and I had competed in powerlifting and I was a personal trainer. So I was not really qualified, but not completely underqualified, I guess. Um, so anyway, I went to this INBF show and they're like, oh, everyone's polygraph tested and, you know, the winners, your analysis tested and then they, they compete at the pro level. And there were some really awesome physiques that to me, well, it's probably not exactly the same, but maybe because they're leaner, they look closer to what I saw in pumping iron than the IPB pros of today who are, you know, another order of magnitude bigger. And it kind of just opened my eyes. And at this stage, I was experimenting with stuff like Andro and some of the over-the-counter pro-hormones that, uh, that I was taking before I'd even considered competing. And at that point, I learned about it and I went, you know, I think I need to draw a line in the sand because I have a competitive personality. And I know that if I decide to compete in bodybuilding and I go that route, that if I'm training as hard as I can, if I'm doing my nutrition correctly, and if I'm not succeeding like I want to do competitively, that the next place for me to go is is to up the dose. Uh, and I could easily see myself knowing my personality, being some of the the people who, uh, you know, John and Mike have said not to be, right? So I think for me, it uh, it took some self awareness to know a that's who I am. B I do want to compete, and then when I start, sat down and started talking to other natural bodybuilders, I think. I realized that it wasn't necessarily getting huge or having that look that, that attracted me to the sport. It was the the process of pushing myself as far as I could and and learning that I could accomplish more than I thought I could. So um, that's why I chose to kind of cut that line of thinking off, draw that line in the sand, and still compete. Um, and I think that's even changed over time. You know, now that I'm well, into my fourth season and do my 10th show I'm in my thirties. And I'm thinking about the history. I, I connect a lot more to the kind of that, that physical cultural idea of, uh, bodybuilding enhancing all aspects of my life. And I, I, I do think, and I think John's a great example of that, that it is certainly possible to have a holistic development, a deep connection to the sport and, um, do it as responsibly as possible and still go the enhanced route. But I think on average, you know, that's, that's unfortunately not common. And part of that's probably because there's not a lot of good information out there. So I hope we can, we can do something to change that. So the 3D muscle journey, the reason why we've made that choice and why we promote that choice is just because, uh, we see it as a piece of a whole and it is the rare person who can, uh, I think make the legal decisions and the health decisions responsibly and do that and, and, and not have it have some kind of negative impact. So, uh, that, that's kind of, we're, well, we like to say we're, we're pro drug free, not anti drug. And we certainly don't believe that, uh, someone can't do drugs responsibly. It's just that, um, it's certainly a little harder and it probably takes more thought as I think we've, we've understood from our guests. So that, that's, that's the reason I made that personal decision, but, um, I know it, it changes for other people. Some people it's a, it's a legal thing. Others it's a, it's a moral thing, which I don't agree with. I kind of, line up with people should be allowed to do what they want. I just want them to be informed when they do it. So, so yeah, that's my position. John, back to uh, the trend talk now. Thank you, Eric, for the uh, insight. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, uh, John, I got a question for you, and then I want to ask uh, Mike a question. Is What would some of the most common misconceptions be from those that are interested or those uh, or when steroids are talked about that people are mistaken? Because as Eric said, he went on a journey. He strongly, you know, had to think about things. He weighed the pros and cons. He's a methodical individual that's intelligent taking his time. But for most people, they probably just have a few associations when they think of uh, steroids or their choice to try and become enhanced. What are the common misconceptions? I'd say the biggest one is the pure volume of drugs that people say is needed. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, I used to have this approach where even when I did start taking PDs, I didn't take them in the off season. And I had this philosophy. I thought if I want to try to build as much muscle naturally as I can. And then the gears want to help me maintain my muscle when I diet hard, because it is very difficult to keep your muscle when you are in a, a low caloric state, when you're hypocaloric, that's just, it's just true. And, you know, that was kind of, so I look at this, these, there's these levels. So first of all, 
you don't need to take probably nearly as much as everybody's telling you you need to take. Second of all, I would still never lose sight of the fact, try to build as much muscle as you can naturally. Um, and then, you know, if you're not happy at that point, maybe you can increase what you take or whatever. But, you know, the, the whole health thing, you're not going to figure it out on your own. You need to have a good doctor that you work with. The problem is finding a good doctor. I'm very fortunate in that respect. So, and another thing I would say is if, if you know, the, 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 you can't just say, I'll be fine. If I take 500 megs of tests, I'll be fine. You probably will, but just to be on the safe side, I would make sure you're getting your labs done. Um, just to be on the safe side. So I, I think, I mean, the part that really drives me crazy is just the volume of drugs people are told they have to take now. And the other thing is, I just don't think people give enough credit to diet and training and what you can do naturally. Uh, I know it's easy for me to say, but I did really well naturally. I mean, I was, I think I was probably around 190 pounds and shredded to the bone at my height naturally. And I just wish people would just be willing to put in more time. I did that as a, as a teenager going into my early 20s. So to me, there's misconceptions about how much you need. There's misconceptions about how how good you can get naturally. There's there's misconceptions about, well, I can take X amount and I'm going to be healthy or I can take X amount and I'm going to die. As Mike said, it's there's you can say probably, but be on the safe side. So if you just break it down to the basics, you can actually do really well if you train hard and you work hard on your nutrition. Are you going to be in Mr. Olympia? Absolutely not. But why don't you just start there? Let's get there first before you start worrying about how much trend you're going to take. And then um, the other thing is, I want to throw this out there too, because the mentality also used to be you took the off season off of chemicals. And then somewhere along the line, probably around 2000, it became the amount of time that you're on is the amount of time you should be off. So if you're on for 12 weeks, you should be off for 12 weeks. And then there was a couple coaches out there, a couple coaches that I'm sure Mike knows that changed the narrative on that. Then it became, you need six week cycles when you're off. You need to be off for six weeks. So whether you were prepping for a show for four months or three months, whatever, you only need to be off for six weeks. Here's your PCT plan. Here's your plan to get your own hormones going for six weeks. And then it turned into, you can't never be off. If you're not slamming the chemicals, you have to at least be on a low dose for HRT. So it's compl- I've seen it completely change from take them when you compete to never come off. And you just, what they call blast and cruise. Um, so the other thing is you don't have to always be on. Uh, anytime someone has a chance to come off and restore their own hormones, whether it's with HCG or all the other things that we can get into in another podcast, you always want to do that. So you don't have to always be on. You don't have to take tons of it. Work hard on your, your nutrition, your training naturally. And I think you could be surprised at how well you really do. Um, those are kind of the bare bone fundamentals. That, that That's the kind of stuff people need to realize before they start getting into the minutia. It's kind of like training. Like before you worry about your frequency and your volume and all that stuff, you might want to make sure you're actually working hard. You know what I mean? Yeah, you might absolutely. have to make sure you're putting some effort into it before you start getting into the minutia. And John, you said that I think I, I, if I track your timeline right, you competed first at 13. You started training probably a little earlier than that, and you didn't first use anabolics until your early 20s, right? So you had a you had about a decade of training under your belt, dedicated, serious, loving lifting before that was a serious consideration. Oh yeah, right? and I was training hard too. I, I went to seminar. I saw a, a Tom Platt seminar when I was 14 years old. He's sitting there and he's talking about Golgi tendon bodies and sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'm like, damn, these bodybuilders are smart. Turns out Tom was one of the few um, that was. I saw Lee Haney at um, seminars. Um, so back then, man, what I did was I went to the magazines. And whatever the magazine said to do, I did. I did the whole routines. I'm not going to sit here and tell you they were the best routines, but they were pretty daggone good. I mean, a four-on-one off or something like that. It's not bad, right? But what I did know is I knew I had to work hard. So I was working really, really hard. Now, was it the best routine for a teenager? Probably not. But was it better than 90% of the stuff that most people do? Yeah, it probably was. It all boiled down to 
you know, we had no fear of overtraining in the 80s, 90s. There was no such thing in the bodybuilding world. No one ever talks about overtraining. Overtraining definitely exists, right? You can only, as Mike's talked about handling volume, you can only handle so much volume. It definitely exists. But back then, man, we were just like, I'm just going to kill myself. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to train like a maniac. But we were in, you know, we were eating tons of the Mega Mass 2000 back then. I called it Mega Gas 2000, right? So, um, yeah, man, I, you know, worked really, really hard on the foundation. And when people told me I couldn't do it naturally, I, I said, yeah, I can. Now the reality is they were right. I never could have been a pro naturally. But I think it helped me to have that, to be ignorant. Because I was like, I'll prove them wrong. I don't care. I will do it naturally. You know, and then I got a little bit older and wiser. But look at where I was when I got to that point. I was, I was at, uh, you know, I was winning shows, open shows, not yeah. teenage shows. I was, I was winning men's shows, you know. I have a, a final question for this episode of the podcast because I think I could speak for myself and Eric when I say this has been a fascinating discussion. And I actually would love to have both of you guys back on. Um, I want to ask you, Mike, a little bit of a different question. It's Mike, I understand. It's fine. I get it. Okay. You don't have to say anything, okay? You know, no, the, the look in the eyes tells me everything. Um, I want to ask you, Mike, about uh, the culture and attitude of anabolic use around the world where you kind of said, you know, here in uh, the West, in terms of legal ramifications, it's a little different than uh, uh, parts of Europe and then uh, the Middle East. Did you say that? Like, what are the different attitudes then by region? So in Russia and the Eastern Bloc countries, the attitude is that you use these compounds in pursuit of a very exotic sport goal in conjunction with a team of sports scientists and coaches. Uh, now there's a newer attitude of recreational European style use there, but fundamentally they don't actually take nearly as much gear as you would think. Every Russian powerlift I've ever talked to, and I've hung out with a whole lot of them, and I've translated for a bunch. They like tell me stories about how much they heard Americans take, and I was like, uh huh. And they're like, but that's not, but that's not true. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's nothing. And they're like, no, that can't be true. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. They're like, but that's insane. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. What the, we have money in America, so they can buy it. Um, so there's like a bit more of a reverence there, and it's there's an understanding that sport is a process, and there's almost a good, not a cultural understanding, but in sport, there's an understanding of long-term athlete development. In a lot of the Eastern European countries, you don't get into sports by yourself. You get into sports through a club, and the club has a culture of you have to earn various dues until you get to be a better qualified, better competing, and then the coaches talk to you about some shit you need to hear about. It does not, you know, if you start doing it too early or something, it would just be like you wouldn't even know where to get it, first of all. And second of all, it would just be like baffling to people. Um, and then they sort of use it as an – in literal sense as an enhancement, not as like a meat and potatoes. Um, from my experiences, otherwise – uh, in the, I'm not entirely sure what happens in the Middle East. Uh, I can sort of, sort of surmise. Uh, but uh, in a lot of countries in the Middle East, the gear is not illegal. You just go to the pharmacy and there it is. And there, unfortunately, the, um, the amount of information they get, especially translated to English, is, is really low. And to them, it, it's almost like, you know, it's like it's something you take in a creatine. Like we treat, treat creatine here. The, the, do you gear like that there? Uh, I've been asked by an un, inordinate number of uh, Middle Eastern teenagers, like, what should my cycle be? And I'm like, holy fuck. Like, most American teenagers just know not to ask you that, even if they're thinking about it. There, it's like, it's just uh, just super straightforward. Like, hey, this, I take this, right? I'm like, oh my God, you're 16 years old. And they're like, yeah, so? I'm like, ah. doesn't anyone, t like, you know, it's like, I figured you know, but not. Um, and then in Europe, it, like, there's a clubbing culture in Europe, I think. Uh, we don't really have in the United States. I don't know, Canada may be different. You guys love clubbing. Um, Canada's the Europe of the United States, really, as far as I'm concerned. That's right. Canada's in the United States. You heard that correctly. So, um, and in, in Europe, it seems like like part of club, clubbing festival culture. Um, you know the Z's. You know Z's. Uh, I'm sure you guys know who that is. Like that he's Australian or whatever. But that's yeah. really an extension of that Euro clubbing culture. Yeah, is they'll take shit um, to get in shape for God knows what fuckery uh, festivals. And it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's, a, it's again, a, like the United Kingdom, uh, the drugs are illegal for personal use. So people just be like, Oh, I'll just take this. And I'm like, all right. I mean, if you insist, but th there's other ways of doing it. The, the, per in the United States for better or for worse, 
that there's this idea that these these drugs are just they're they're there and it's like this demon in the room. It's a powerful demon, but you know it's bad. Yeah. Right. Everyone in the U.S. gets this education when you're 16. Your teacher does this. You're gonna take drugs. You're gonna kill you. In Europe, they seem to be like, oh, this is like pretty cool. I'm gonna take like deep tab and be in shape for festival. And you're like. <laughs> All right, I guess it's pretty lousy fair, but there's not that reverence, which could be a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. So that's been my perception. Um, I, mean, I don't know. I, I will say this. Um, I, John may be able to corroborate this or not. European pro bodybuilders, especially of the late 90s to early 2000s, took amounts, especially of growth and insulin, that I thought were just – there's a joke. There's no way someone can push this much gear. But they did it. Like there's a couple of notable European bodybuilders, like Swiss bodybuilders, German bodybuilders, that took amounts of gear that were like comical, and they looked comical, uh, and it was like I just. And, but they were really cool about it, you know. Like uh, the American bodybuilders take a lot of gear. They're like fucking training, brother, fucking iron war and sacrifice. And the European guys, like they would literally smoke cigarettes and be like, yeah, so I'm on like 10 grams, which is fine. I feel pretty good. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's just totally relaxed attitude. I don't know, John. Can you speak to that at all, or? Yeah, the big German. <laughs> I know exactly you're There's talking about. There's a couple about. of those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very different culture in the women too, actually. Oh, and like more like open about uh, just. Oh you know. yeah, yeah, the women like it. I mean, masculinization. Who cares? You yeah. know. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Guys, this has been a very interesting conversation. I want to thank both John Meadows and Mike Isretel for being on the podcast. To me, this kind of opened up the conversation where we still have, uh, myself and Eric, a lot of other questions. So we would love to have you back on the channel. I think it's important to have these frank, open conversations where we have the, you know, the confluence of ideas in a genuine way. John, I would first ask you, where can people find you for more information in regards to your coaching, your information, all those sorts of things? Well, uh, I'm Mountain Dog One on YouTube, and I would appreciate some uh, subscribers there, <laughs> and uh, also on Instagram. And my Mountain Dog, well, the website is mountaindogdiet.com. I uh, just want you to know, John, I didn't mention this at the start of the podcast, but I actually did your arm workout from T Nation way back in the day, where it was biceps supersetting with triceps. And it was the first time I ever got like an insanely massive bicep cramp that was uncomfortable, where I went to just curl my arm afterwards and it just seized me like that. Locked up, locked up on you. And I've, and I've never forgot. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> and then, Mike, where can people find the evil genius? Yeah. So actually, it's good that you asked, but pertinent to this podcast, uh, Broderick Chavez is the guy that gives me all my knowledge on this, more or less. And he is a coach specializing in exactly what we just talked about. So if you want to not make stupid decisions and have someone guide you intelligently with uh, tons of nuance, and he like takes the Mensa test every year as a joke and aces it and then never submits it because he hates the idea of Mensa. So he's real smart. Um, Evil Genius Sport Performance. Just Google it on Instagram and uh, Facebook, and I would contact him right there um, for any non-drug related inquiries. Uh, RP Dr. Mike on Instagram, Mike is on Facebook, renaissanceperiodization.com. Ta-da. Appreciate the clarification. I appreciate both of you guys being on. I want to thank everyone that has been listening to this podcast or watching it. If you've enjoyed it, you're on the YouTube. Go ahead give a like, consider sharing with some of the you know. And then lastly, if you're on iTunes or uh, somewhere like Spotify listening, go ahead and feel free to leave us a rating and review. We appreciate it. We'll see everyone back next week with another episode of Iron Culture.